What's up everybody? I'm so excited about this one. Yeah, I said I was gonna be done with these episodes, but I don't know, I just love this time of the year. And I thought it would be fun to revamp the formula a little bit and do a Halloween special. So I've written a little something with the usual melody to demonstrate a couple of things in this style. The full pieces at the end, files are available on Patreon. So let's start. First topic of the day is the Dies Ire. I'm not butchering the name, I know, I'm aware, everybody calls it the DS Ray, but um, it actually comes from Latin. The English translation is the Day of Wrath, and this is basically like a super ancient Latin chant that describes the Judgment Day. The trumpet summoning souls before the throne of God, where the saved will be delivered and the unsaved cast into eternal flames. This little motif permeated medias of all kinds and is being famously referenced to represent death and the feeling of dread in lots and lots of film scores, most notably in The Shining. And of course, if you've watched the movie, you'll see how this is a perfect use. It's not only being used for horrors though, here's a few others off the top of my mind. My personal favourite is from The Nightmare Before Christmas where the first few notes get repeated over and over and become the actual tune. The way I use this little melody in my own piece is a little bit more loose, you know, most times hidden under other parts. It works great as a bass part, for example, as you can hear it here on Celeste. Also, if you want to deliver the message in a much bolder statement, it works great on brass and tubular bells. <laughs> So yeah, it might be a little bit cliche, but I, I think it's fine. It's an effective little device that can be useful in a few different scenarios. Of course, that alone is not going to be enough to create a spooky kind of vibe. So how do you do that? Let's talk about that. There are a couple of different instruments often coming up in the genre. And if you're going for a more retro sci-fi kind of vibe, we have, of course, the Thurman. The most famous example in cinema may be from the movie The Day the Earth Stood Still. Bernard Herrmann was the absolute master of dread, and this soundtrack is just wonderfully frightful. And of course, this may not sound very spooky for today's standards, but there are some more modern examples as well. Here's one of my favorite ones from the show The Simpsons. This is more like a nod to the tradition of cinema and being the show a wacky comedy, the Thurman is used as a comedic effect. Try and keep this in mind as it's actually quite important, you know, this crossover between comedy and Halloween and we'll talk about it in more detail later. So in my piece I like the idea of not only using the Thurman but experimenting with a few other layers as well to create a more unique sound. Like here with the solo violin doubling the melody in unison. Or here as well with the bass flute in English shown doubling at lower octave. I particularly like this one later in the piece using the French horns for a more fierce kind of moment. Another common instrument normally associated with Halloween, maybe a little bit less niche than the Thurman, is the pipe organ. Why is that though? Well, the easy answer, which is really all we have time for today, is that a lot of these stereotypes are created by Hollywood itself. Some of them can make a little bit more sense than others, of course, like the Thurman being used a lot in sci-fi 
because it literally sounds like a weird alien instrument. But when it comes to other stuff like the organ, this is probably because, you know, the instrument has been used for decades over and over to represent like bad guys. The way I used it is much more subtle, mostly for background alongside other church-like instruments like bells and choir. It's certainly not the protagonist here, but it contributes to a specific atmosphere and this is key. What these spooky sounds are doing really is just establishing a vibe by, you know, making the music overly dramatic and exaggerating some of its features. Do you remember when I said the music has some degree of crossover with comedy? That's exactly what I meant. So let me explain in more detail. So this is similar to what you would do with comedy, right? Like exaggerating every single little thing and playing all the stereotypes. But within the context of a Halloween piece, what you get in return is a much more grotesque, peculiar atmosphere. And that's because of the harmony and the orchestration. Basically, and I know I'm oversimplifying, but in truth, Halloween music is an overly theatrical version of horror with some fantasy and comedy elements that sometimes manage to sneak their way in. The absolute master of this, and you all know I couldn't not talk about him, is the great Danny Elfman. A lot of his work in collaboration with Tim Burton shows these very features, you know, combining horror music tropes with fantastical or comical elements, with the music being a vital part of the movie's atmosphere. Two great examples are the films Sleepy Hollow and Beetlejuice. The fascinating because while employing more horror tropes and imagery than fantasy, these films and subsequently the music are too stylized or whimsically comical to be frightening enough to fit the standard horror mold. So let's have a look at some typical Elfman-like orchestrations. You have, of course, the Celeste, which I believe he used in all the Burton's movies. The way I used it in my piece is in conjunction with other percussion instruments like piano and harp. And this is just to make it my own a little bit more and create a slightly different color. Celeste alone, though, is excellent in a variety of scenarios. It has a very innocent, fragile, yet mysterious quality. And that is why it's a common instrument in many other genres other than horror. Keyboard instruments in general are also great at providing support to woodwinds like so. A different common orchestration Elfman often likes to use is an offbeat string pizzicato. This part lays underneath the arpeggio we played before and if we put them together you see how it makes it a little bit more quirky. Another typical Elfman's device can be using very high or very low registers like this high string tremolo chord I used at the very beginning of the piece or low woodwinds such as bass clarinet, bassoon and contrabassoon to create a lot of grittiness. And keep in mind that you don't necessarily have to, you know, copy Elfman all the time simply because he's the king of, you know, Halloween music. You can blend it in with your own stuff, the things that you like. Let's take a closer look at these wells. In fact, we have a combination of a few different parts. These are the strings. These are the woodwinds. And here's the brass. The muty brass is like the little cherry on top, right? Like if we combine all these elements together, you get a very peculiar, distinctive kind of mood. It's background stuff, but it works well within the section, you know, making the music a little bit harsher, more dramatic or theatrical. Everything we have been talking about so far, you know, without these wells, the music would be a little bit too simple. The rest of the orchestration for the piece is, you know, normal stuff combined with some of the things that we have been talking about, 
plus a couple of quirks. A very unusual instrument you find from time to time is the harpsichord. I believe the reason may be to exaggerate the sense of nostalgia for all the times, you know, to be overly retro. Secondly, and this is actually important enough to be a topic on its own, is how orchestration should convey a sense of melancholy. This may be counterintuitive, but while I don't think it's necessarily important for Halloween music to sound scary or creepy, it's crucial for it to be melancholic. Go and listen to the soundtrack of The Nightmare Before Christmas and tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, that's like quintessential Halloween music and still you can find moments like this. Oh, somewhere deep inside of these bones. That's a particularly strong example, of course, but a lot of this kind of music comes from a melancholic place. You'll oftentimes see woodwinds and solo instruments picking up the melody. So let's take a look at this section, for example. We have the English horn and alto flute on the melody and some solo strings on the chords. And in the background, piano and celeste for vibe. It's a very simple kind of orchestration, but super effective. And when you combine all these instruments together, you get a very pensive, sad kind of mood. English horn and oboe are particularly good at, you know, this moody stuff. But, you know, the music doesn't necessarily have to sound small and intimate. It can, in fact, be soaring and melancholic both at the same time, like in that, you know, Elfman example we played before. What we have here is a combination of a few different things. Firstly, a run on piano, and what's important is the downward motion. The rest of the orchestra is quite static, basically just holding a chord. Then the melody goes to strings and winds, once again with the English horn supported by the violins, and the rest of the woodwind section later, while the rest of the orchestra is simply contributing to the build-up. So this moment is particularly dramatic because the music is progressively getting bigger and higher in register while it's moving slowly and insisting on the same couple of cadences. So that's the trick. That's about everything I wanted to talk about today. So uh, let me show you the piece in full.
that's everything for today. If you're interested in a more in-depth look into my logic session, you can check out my Patreon where I've shared exactly that alongside the files with this project and many other projects as well. If you're interested in learning more about composition in general, you can check out my course 20th Century Orchestral Writing. Like the video if you did, subscribe if you're new. Thank you very much for watching and happy Halloween. Thank you.